Well, here we are again uh, in our four priority study. We're on chapter 23 today, uh, the need for evangelism. You say, what in the world is evangelism? Well, evangelism essentially is uh, helping other people to uh, know about and understand the good news of what Jesus Christ uh, has done for them in his life, death, and resurrection, uh, and how he can invade their lives and change them. Uh, another way to say it is how people can become a friend with Jesus. Uh, you know, one of the things, I think if you go back and read the chapter, if you haven't already, or if you, you review it, you will see that um, uh, one of the, the devastating things about people that don't know Christ and have a personal relationship with him uh, are lost. Remember a number of years ago when I was in high school, uh, I got lost. And here's how it happened. I had an uncle who had bought a boat, and he asked my stepfather, myself, and another friend to go out into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, we took off early one morning uh, and got out of the Gulf, and man, there were big cruise ships and uh, freighters going by us, and it was really kind of exciting. But about midday, after we had stopped the boat to do a little fishing, my uncle tried to start the boat again, and the boat wouldn't start. It was deader than a doornail. Then he tried to radio for help, and the radio wouldn't work. I mean, we were stuck. Well, all these boats and ships were passing us, but now, after the boat wouldn't start and the communication had failed, uh, there were no more boats. We couldn't flag them down. We were, we, there was not even to try to, to, to beckon our way. So we ended up staying all night on that boat. Well, there were no cell phones, and the communication was down in the boat, so my mom had no idea where I was. Over the night, a fog moved in. And so again, that had its own dangers in that if a ship did come by and the radar uh, had not picked us up, they could literally <laughs> run over our little boat. I guess it was about seven o'clock the next morning, we thought we heard a horn. Well, the next thing we knew, this uh, boat pulled up and uh, it had been looking for us all night long. They were getting ready to send helicopters out to look for us when this boat pulled up and, and rescued us and towed us in. Uh, I'll never forget that event and the feelings that I felt knowing that we were lost. And I really didn't know we'd ever be found. But there's something more serious about this whole lostness thing, and that is that it is important to understand that if a man or a woman or a young person does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They are lost, lost in the terms of being disconnected and out of a relationship with a godly universe through Jesus Christ, and they need to be found. And so that's what chapter 23 is all about. So I want to make some observation, and, and I'm going to highlight a few things in the chapter and then add a few new thoughts as we look at this today. First of all, people are lost. People are lost without Christ. But why, why do we often feel lost in the world in which we live? Well, the world in which we live, first of all, is a world that is a dark world. Dark in, in terms of people's morals, dark in terms of people's thinking uh, correctly about the God that made them and sent Jesus to rescue them, uh, dark in, in, in the sense of the, the lives that people live and the relationships that are often... Um, uh, torn apart because of this lack of, uh, uh, of light that Christ can bring in a person's life. Secondly, uh, people live in a fallen world. Fallen in the sense that we're disconnected and fallen away from the God that made us. Um, and then I think also uh, people are spiritually in the world dead. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.1, Paul, speaking to people in Ephesus who had come to know Christ, and he looks back at their condition before they came to know Christ, and in Ephesians 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, and you were, past tense, and you were dead. Now, what that means is dead, dead in the sense that they were incapable of responding to the life of God. 
In other words, they didn't have the capacity or the ability to respond to the God that made them and loved them and even sent his son to rescue them. In and of themselves, they could not do that. Also, we live in a world that's relativistic. What does that mean? It means that we live in a world where people do not believe there's any such thing as true truth. There's no consensus in our country that there's any body of truth that's true for all times, for all people. And so as a result of that, we make up our own rules. We make up our own uh, rights and wrongs, whatever is convenient, whatever is politically correct, etc. And we are in a mess as a result of that. Also, we live in a world that's hurting. Relationships are hurting. People are hurting physically, emotionally, psychologically. Uh, people hurt. And in fact, there's probably not a person that's watching this uh, video that presently or in the past or in the future, you've experienced or will experience hurt, significant hurt. So we live in a world that's hurting. And then we live in a world that's uh, hopeless, a world that where people basically uh, feel like that, that they're trapped. Let me draw you an illustration of that that might uh, lay that out for you. Uh, there is a philosophy, and, and I think this will make sense to you, and I call this philosophy the philosophy of the closed system. And what that means is in this philosophy, people believe that in this world they are trapped. If there's any help outside this world, this system, there's no way it can ever get in. And inside the system, we're, we're, we're trapped. We're determined. In fact, there is a whole philosophy that perhaps some of you studied when you were in the university called determinism, which means we're stuck. So therefore, the, 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 the consequences of the thinking is eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow you're going to die. And that's it. Trapped. Well, um, there is some good news, and we're going to get into that a little bit next week, and we'll touch on it a little bit today. If you go back to the Old Testament, for example, and read from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, this is what it says. It says, Who has believed our message? To whom will the Lord reveal his saving power? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender shoot. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with bitterness and grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way when he went by. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God for his own sins. But he was wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. He was whipped, and we were healed. All of us have strayed away like sheep. We have left God's past to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the guilt, the shame, and the sins of us all. Isaiah chapter 53, written 700 years before the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would step foot on this planet. And it's telling us then, 700 years prior to his coming, what will happen to him as he gives his life for us on the cross and die a cruel, a horrendous death 700 years before it actually happened. Then if you turn in the New Testament to the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, verse number 14, I'll read a few verses here. And it says, in the beginning, verse 1, John 1, the Word already existed. He was with God, and he was always God. Then you can read on down through the passage, and you kind of say, well, that's interesting. The word, what is the word? I don't understand that. But then once you get to verse 14, it gets exciting. It says, and so the word became human and lived here on the earth among us. The word was Jesus Christ. The word spoken about 700 years before in the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter now steps on this planet in human form. 
lives for 33 years on this planet, speaks truth, heals people, but then goes to a cross and dies on a cross to take on him, this person called Jesus, the shame, the guilt, and the results of our sin upon the cross himself. So, you say, so what is that? How do, I, how do I respond to that? Well, verse number 12 in John chapter 1 tells us, and it says, But to all who believed or trusted him and accepted him, Jesus, he gave the right to become a child of God. And so what he's saying there is there comes a point when we hear about this person called Jesus, we begin to know a little bit of who he is and what he did and why he did it. When we understand that he came to rescue us from our plight to, to come through that to come through that system and pop through and land on the planet and, and die on a cross. He says, if you will believe that and give your allegiance to me, I will come in your life. I will clean you up. I will give you a new, a new status as a child of God. Well, I wonder if this all is true. This, and this, this whole thing of evangelism, telling other people about Jesus, and, and, and should we do it? Why don't I do it if I do believe it? And a lot of questions. Well, let me close with this illustration. I have a friend named Leighton Ford. And Leighton Ford, I think, still lives in, in the Carolinas. And he used to work for one of my heroes, Billy Graham. And he was uh, teaching a course that I took when I was in graduate school, but he tells a story about uh, debating an atheist in Canada a number of years ago on national television over there. He said as the debate went on, they got about halfway through it, and finally he said, you know, we need to stop the debate. He said, because I'm not going to come to your point of view as an atheist, and you're not going to come to my point of view. But let me say this in conclusion. He said, if you are right and I'm wrong, you've lost nothing. But if you, as an atheist, are wrong and I, as a follower of Jesus, am right, you're in deep trouble. So he said the debate was over. He went back to his hotel room. And he said, 3 o'clock in the morning, his phone rang. And it was the atheist. And he said, Mr. Ford, could we meet tomorrow morning for coffee? I need to talk to you. And what the man was convicted of was there was truthfulness in the historicity and the reality of this person, Jesus of Nazareth, who came, who lived, who died, who rose from the dead, and is coming again. Well, the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ. You think about that real hard.